Okay, so um, Dr. Borger, uh, thank you very much for coming today. Hello. Um, I will introduce myself. Uh, I am Mateo Marin Cuartas, um, Cardiac Surgery Resident in Leipzig and Editor in Chief of the LACES platform, and Tulio Caldonazo, Associate Editor from the uh, LACES platform as well. And we have today our uh, very special guest. We are honored and happy to have you here, Dr. Borger. He is a director of cardiac surgery in uh, uh, the Heart Center of Leipzig. And he's going to talk today about the new uh, guidelines for infective endocarditis. We basically will talk about the um, um, latest changes and the most important changes and updates in the guidelines. So we are happy to have you here. Thank you for your time and looking forward to talk to you a little bit. Thanks very much, Matteo and Tulio. It's a great honor for me to speak to you and hopefully to many uh, cardiac surgeons across South America today. Thank you. Okay, so let's start with the first question. Um, basically, the first question is not a question, it's more like, a, could you please like sort of summarize the most significant changes in the endocarditis guidelines? Well, which were the most important changes that we all need to know? Yeah, so these guidelines were just published in August of this year. Um, they are guidelines that are um, produced by the European Society of Cardiology. And myself and uh, Victoria Delgado uh, were the co-chairs of a large task force that included many cardiologists, but also infectious disease specialists and also several cardiac surgeons. And this was an important update because the last version of the endocarditis guidelines was published back in uh, 2015. So there were some uh, particularly important changes in this document in comparison to the uh, previous version. Um, for example, we broadened the indications for antibiotic prophylaxis for high-risk patients. High risk means all patients that had previous heart valve surgery. So that's a lot of our patients. Doesn't matter if it was a valve replacement or a repair, they are automatically categorized as high risk for future uh, endocarditis. Any patient who previously had endocarditis is automatically at high risk for future endocarditis. We know that patients who get it in the past have a higher risk of getting it again in the future. Patients with uncorrected congenital uh, heart disease, cyanotic congenital heart disease, or um, patients that were operated on, on the valve as children and uh, now are adults. And then also a, an ever-growing population as those patients that had a TAVI procedure or even uh, CLIP procedures, we classified them all as uh, high risk. So anybody who's had anything done to the valve is considered high risk. And that means for the rest of their life, they need to receive antibiotic prophylaxis before all oral dental procedures. But we also added a new recommendation that these same patients um, uh, may get uh, um, uh, antibiotic prophylaxis if they're undergoing procedures on the genital urinary tract or the gastrointestinal tract or the upper respiratory tract. So th those are new uh, recommendations. We eased up the indications for antibiotic prophylaxis. We also made some big changes to the diagnostic criteria. It's still based on the old Duke criteria um, for the diagnosis of uh, infective endocarditis, but um, with, with the major and the minor criteria. But what's new is included in the major criteria are advanced cardiac imaging uh, techniques. So of course, echo is the most commonly used technique to say that a patient has endocarditis uh, and is the first technique that we should use. But for example, for patients with prosthetic valves, or with TAVI valves, sometimes echo, it's hard to see if there are big, uh, vegetations and therefore you end up doing a cardiac CT or a um, PET scan or even a white blood cell SPECT scan. And if any of those advanced cardiac imaging uh, techniques also show signs of endocarditis, vegetations or an abscess or something around the prosthesis, which can be hard to see with echo, then that counts as a major criteria. So that's new. Then um, with regards to antibiotics, uh, we included the POET study criteria. For those of you who don't know, um, the POET study uh, randomized patients to receive K2 
continuing IV antibiotic therapy or oral antibiotic therapy starting 10 days after initially being treated for their endocarditis. It also included patients that underwent cardiac surgery in the past for endocarditis, as long as they are at least seven days after the operation. And then the we have specific inclusion and exclusion criteria from the POET trial um, in the endocarditis guidelines saying, if a patient meets these criteria with the right organism and is stable and doing well, then you can switch them to oral antibiotics and that way spare them from three to four extra weeks of IV therapy in a hospital. So that's going to help a lot of uh, patients with getting uh, earlier on uh, uh, with along with their normal uh, life uh, activities and, and um, their quality of life improving by getting them out of the hospital. Then with regards to surgery, uh, we had one brand new indication. It's a 2B, so surgery may be con uh, considered um, for patients with a vegetation of more than 10 millimeters and no other indication for surgery. So the other indications for surgery for vegetations are if they're embolizing um, or if they have another reason for surgery, then you would say, yeah, okay, we go ahead and operate. But even a vegetation of 10 millimeters or more without any other reason to operate, then we said, you may still operate on those patients in order to prevent a stroke from occurring. Um, the other thing we did for the surgical indications is that we very specifically defined the time frames. We have emergent indications, and those patients should be operated on within 24 hours. We have urgent indications, which are all defined there in the document, where the patients should be operated on within three to five days. And then we have non-urgent patients, and those patients should be operated on in the same hospital stay, but not necessarily within the first three to five days. And those, we wanted to sort of put pressure on surgeons to say, okay, if you have an indication to operate, for example, a patient has already had a couple of emboli and a couple of small strokes and still has a vegetation on the valve, then there's no sense in waiting. Once the indication is there, just go ahead and do the operation. It doesn't have to be done tonight, but do it within the next three days. Otherwise, you're just exposing the patient to additional risk um, uh, before the procedure even begins. So, and then the last point I would like to, to point out as a, as a major change is that we more clearly defined what the implications are of a stroke. So we as cardiac surgeons quite frequently see patients with endocarditis where we're first consulted after the patient has already had a stroke. And in the past, we were sort, sort of conservative and there's still many centers around the world where they say, oh, don't touch the patient for four weeks. And we clearly uh, stated in the document, this is the wrong strategy. And we said, okay, just look as the patient had a, an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke. If it's an ischemic stroke, just go ahead and do the operation emergency, urgent, or non-urgent, depending on the, the different categories according to the clinical situation of the patient. But don't delay the patient, delay the operation unnecessarily. And then what we wrote is for hemorrhagic stroke, because that's been shown in many studies, small studies, but many of them, that the risk of that hemorrhage transforming and getting even bigger during cardiopulmonary bypass is actually quite low. And therefore we said, okay, if there's a hemorrhagic stroke present, then we look for favorable brain bleed, favorable brain bleed features. That means if the amount of hemorrhage is less than 30 milliliters in the CT or MRI, or if the NIH stroke scale score is less than 12, then you should just go ahead and operate. Um, if, uh, if there's a bigger bleed or if the patient has a, a bad neurologic uh, prognosis, then we would say, okay, just wait. And of course, those patients that have had a stroke that have a terrible neurologic pro prognosis, we do not uh, recommend operating on those patients at all. Okay, that's perfect. That's a really good overview. Thank you very much, Dr. Bar. I have one question, and the point is like you commented about surgical indications, about antibiotic therapy, and 
Do you have any new thoughts about like the role of the endocarditis team? Is there like new, like any novelty in the guidelines about like how important it is to address all the cases in a multidisciplinary team? This is a great question, Tulio. So in the um, document, we have even a, a figure, a new figure, where we differentiate between referring centers and heart valve centers. And every hospital needs a functioning endocarditis team because this is a, a disease that it's not terribly common, but it's also not rare. Everybody sees these cases. So at referring centers, that endocarditis, endocarditis team consists of at least two people, somebody with some infectious disease um, uh, capabilities and a cardiologist with imaging expertise. Okay, you may have more people as part of that endocarditis team, but at least those two people is a requirement of a functioning team. And then we have the heart valve centers. And this is uh, formed from many different specialties, but the one specialty that makes the big difference is cardiac surgery. The heart valve centers must have a cardiac surgery department on site. And often with these complex patients, you end up bringing in many other uh, members, especially neurologists or nephrologists or uh, anesthesiologists for pre-op planning if it's a particularly complex patient, et cetera. And in the document, we clearly state what the different criteria are to transfer the patient from the referring center to the heart valve center. For example, if they have prosthetic valve endocarditis, if they start to become hemodynamically unstable, if they embolize, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have several criteria in there and we say, look, then send them to the heart valve center. Not all of them are gonna to need to be operated on right away, but you need to have a surgeon at least take a look at the patient at that stage and decide if an operation is necessary. Excellent, thank you. Um, I have one last question. Um, could you mention some like evidence gaps in endocarditis, which uh, special or like specific topics uh, in patients with endocarditis still need to be researched and developed to improve the treatment of these patients? Unfortunately, there's a lot of evidence gaps in the uh, endocarditis space. Almost all of the evidence that we had to rely upon for this document was what we would call level of C evidence, so expert opinion. There was occasionally level B and rarely level A. There are very few randomized trials in this area. One of them is the POET study that I just referred to. Um, but the vast majority of these studies are retrospective. And, and this is a problem. We need to perform uh, prospective randomized trials. For example, there's one ongoing right now looking at that indication that I spoke about patients with 10 millimeter or bigger vegetation, but no other reason for surgery, and then randomize them to surgery or watchful waiting. So that's an important trial that's currently running here in, in Europe. Um, but there's a whole host of different questions that we need to look at with randomized studies, which, you know, I'm, I'm a bit uh, pessimistic whether or not we'll get them done because one of the reasons is, is that industry is not interested in this area. There's no money to be made in endocarditis. The antibiotic studies, they're all very old, non-randomized, and pharmacy is just not in, pharmaceutical companies are not very interested in performing large antibiotic trials, or heart valve companies are not uh, so interested in supporting these uh, trials either. So we're gonna to have to perform them as investigator initiated studies and get funding from other sources. I know that's difficult, but it's absolutely necessary. Okay, that's perfect. We are really, really grateful, Dr. Varga, to have you here. It was like really grand firing questions. And I don't know, Matteo, do you have any final words? No, I just want to say thank you again. And um, I, I was... Uh, I was there when you were developing these guidelines. I know how much work it is. So congratulations. The guidelines are really good. I have read them, of course, already. And I really enjoy reading them. So congratulations for the great job. And thank you for summarizing them because I'm sure a lot of people will uh, benefit from this video because it's basically really the most important things you need to know about the, the new guidelines. Thank you.
My pleasure, and thank you, Matteo and Tulio, for the uh, invitation. As you know, I have many South Americans here working in my department, and uh, they're fantastic uh, doctors and surgeons. So just a shout out to everybody there in South America. Thanks very much. Hope to see you soon. Thank you. Hey.